one. Welcome to a professor's life. Your look inside the ivory tower. You like the new one? I like the new one. <laughs> yeah, I like that. So, anyway, I'm Chris. Uh, with me is Robert. Hello. And Stephen. Hello there, all folks. And uh, we are back after a bit of a, a delay. We're into our new, let's call it our new season, if we will. And um, The new maybe, semester. Come on now. Let's go with it that way. Ah, we should go with it that way. New semester. Yes. The new semester of a professor's life. Professor's Life 102. <laughs> All right. So um, we have been uh, begging. Well, I shouldn't use the word begging. Asking uh, for show topic ideas. And we actually got one. Thanks to Lutz Warnke. And uh, Lutz, if I'm mispronouncing your name, I apologize. I'm famous at mispronouncing names. Uh, but he contacted us, us at the show and with a question. And the question was... How do we fit research into our schedules? He is uh, moving to a new institution, I believe starting a uh, professor position, and would like to know sort of how that transition is going to work, especially when it comes to research. So what we thought we would do today is talk a little bit about what our typical day is like and talk about sort of how that workload is distributed across the holy trinity of academia, teaching, research, and service and sort of how that balance changes and talk a little bit about work-life balance and these kinds of issues. And we hope that um, this is useful to you, Lutz, and the rest of our, our listeners. So, uh, who would like to start about talking about your typical day? Uh, I'm, I'm happy to take a stab at it. All right, Stephen, go for it. So, I, I have, I guess part of this is understanding what boundaries one sets for themselves. Uh, for me, with children, uh, married and so forth, uh, I try to define my life in terms of 8.30 into 4.30. So it's, it's a pretty set schedule. I don't, get, I don't work beyond 5 almost ever, uh, and I can't get there before about 8.15 because of my son uh, dropping him off at school. So I get into work, and it starts with the whole process of catching up on things. Uh, it's emails. It's see what I've got on my schedule for the day. Uh, have a nice, you know, cup of caffeine, and uh, you know, then I'm trying to to plot out that day. Um, that's usually what my relaxation into the day is. Okay, what am I going to do? Is today a day of service? Is a day today a day of research? Is today a day of uh, meetings? So, for example, today was a day of meetings. Um, I think I had two hours out of my work day that wasn't in a meeting. Um, so that just that's good. I like to stack up my days that way so that I can do one thing very well. Tomorrow is a day of research. I've got nothing on my schedule except for writing. Um, and so that's that's kind of how I try to work throughout the day. Is whatever I'm working on, I want to focus on that one almost exclusively. Uh, on days of teaching, I like to stack up my teaching and get that to be the thing I do. I prep for the teaching. I do the teaching. Then I have my office hours. Uh, so I don't really do much of else. Task switching, as we all know, is a very costly activity and so bouncing from thing to thing to thing is uh is a challenge um i have friends who i know will block out their day such that they will only check their emails at uh, very set schedules they'll, e they'll check their emails at, right when they show up at work they'll check their emails at lunch they'll check their emails later in the day uh, i tend to be of a different generation i guess who means i'm connected to the internet too much uh, so i will do research for a while and then i'm looking for an article so i'll search in google scholar and that will get me to accidentally look on wikipedia for some unknown reason because i want to know about the peloponnesian war um, <laughs> we all get lost but it also relates to the point of I try, although I want to be focused, I also recognize the importance of breaks. So although I will have my head down and write, uh, I will get up out of my seat every half an hour, no matter what. I will get up, I will walk down the hallway, go to the restroom, have a drink, um, say hi to somebody, but get myself out of that chair because we know that sitting in the seat for too long is uh, detrimental. You'll actually start to lose focus, you'll be less productive if you just sit there and never move. Plus. It's just good for overall health to get up and even walk around your chair twice and sit right back down. Um, and then for me, because I, I try to close my day off and, and make this as a family point versus a, a um, you know, work day thing, I, when I get done with my day, I come home, and the only thing I'll do at home in terms of work is check emails. Uh, I do not do work at home. So that, that's kind of my, my block. All right. Uh, Robert, you want to give a stab at it? Yeah, I'm the exact opposite. I pretty much work 24-7, 365. Uh, I'm constantly task switching. <laughs> uh, 
Um, without my calendar, I don't know where I am or what I'm doing. Um, I go from board meetings to committee meetings to mentoring students to meeting, doing outreach, traveling around, uh, dealing with administrators. I do a lot of the, I guess it would be in the service category. Um, that's the biggest part of my job. Um, I kind of like the teaching part because that's nice and scheduled and I know what's going to happen and I can kind of count on it. Uh, but the rest of the time, it's just, you know, someone needs half an hour. Where do I put them? Someone needs an hour. Where do I put them? Uh, fitting them in today. Uh, today, my day started at 730 and it's going to end at, well, 730. <laughs> so um, that's not odd for me. I'll deal with uh, student issues, administration issues, pay issues at home. You know, quick ones over email. I found if I completely shut down and don't do any um, when I'm at home, when I can sneak a few minutes here or there, it really starts to pile up. So I can't, even though I'm, you know, I'll spend some time playing with my daughter. If she like runs to the toilet, I know I got 30 seconds, I can check an email. So I'll do little stuff like that to try to fit things in. Um, and then I probably do another hour after she goes to sleep. So, yeah, recently I've started to get, you know, back into doing research. Um, so, cause I supposedly have the luxury of time now, but, uh, I think I'm going to just have to carve out a day and pretend I don't exist. Um, so I'm going to try to set aside my Fridays to just do research. Yeah. But for me, it's a, it's a weird job, but I don't have a traditional tenure track gig. So I'm now a mixture of faculty and admin like I always have been. So you, Chris, you're more traditional. Yeah, I'm more traditional. I'm not at an institution. Uh, my, my institution's a bit different than Luce's um, tr um, where we're teaching focused. And uh, the thing here is that in order for me to do basically what Stephen does, and I've done this my whole career, basically, I have worked Monday, Wednesday, Monday, to, Monday through Friday, basically, let's call it 8.30 or so to 5, 5.30. I don't typically bring work home, and I typically don't bring work on the weekends because I want to spend that time with my wife or doing things that I want to do. I want to have a life. And so in order to pull that off, I've had to become an expert at time management because I don't have the luxury of really – um, choosing my class times in a way. I mean, I do get to talk about, you know, when I like to have my classes when we're arranging the um, semester schedule, but quite frankly, I'm kind of boxed in with what my other colleagues do. So what I've had to do is sort of learn to build my week. I don't think of a typical day. For me, I think week at a time. I've built my week around when my classes have to be, and then I identify, if I can, and usually I can, a research day, uh, because I typically have the ability to choose when my labs will happen, so I can put them on Tuesdays or put them on Thursdays, and then do research either Tuesday or either Tuesday or Thursday, whatever the case may be. Um, committee meetings are sprinkled throughout the week as well. Um, I have somewhat control over that, but again, when you're trying to schedule a bunch of uh, people together, it sometimes eats into different time. But what I do is, when I'm at work, I'm working. Uh, I'm generally not floating around chatting with other people in offices. I'm generally not hanging out in lounges with students chatting. I do that some, uh, but I spend my time working and I'm efficient at it. Um, and that's how I've been able to really um, successfully maintain a research program at a teaching intensive school where at my first institution, I was teaching the um, equivalent of four three credit courses here I'm teaching the equivalent of three, four credit courses, uh, but that's a high workload, teaching workload, but I've been able to publish about 16 papers in the last 12 years that I've been a professor. So um, that's a pretty strong sort of publication record for a high teaching load kind of, of job. So for me, like I said, I can't take the typical day view. I sort of think of the typical week view and, and plan accordingly. Um, just because the depending on what day of the week, my day is very different from, from one day to the next. And I, again, I, I think I take the same view there, Chris. I, I, do, I do plan out the week, and that's what I'm saying. I try to stack things, and I think that's the difference as well. I mean, I don't have as high of a teaching load um, as well as 
uh, you know, you're on a sabbatical at the moment, and and I've structured my teaching load that I actually get my teaching done in, in one semester. Mm -hmm. uh, that allows me the flexibility to to move directly into a research oriented um, space. You know, right. this is research service. You know, we obviously will have reviewing. That's a big part of my life. Uh, I'm doing PhD recruiting at the moment, so that was a big part of my time as well. Uh, and then soon enough, I'll have PhD. Um, uh, Tennessee exams that I coordinate and, and so forth. So that'll be another chunk of my time. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm able to, because of, of my, my schedule, when I teach, my teaching is almost exclusively my focus and I do very little other than maintenance during that time because uh, I have basically an eight-week teaching schedule. Uh, that's keeping me afloat, do my you know reviewing and, and move something along on the sides on research projects. But otherwise, my time is really, again, I say, what can I do for my week? You know, I got asked to do a, a meeting today and I said you know I can do it on Thursday but I'd rather do it in this little spot on Friday because that's a time that I know uh, won't disrupt my research you know it, it's a better option for me and that worked out right. so I think that you, you need to take that view you need to see how do you fit in yeah. um, we've talked a lot here as well in terms of the uh, the blocking out the weekends and blocking out the evenings um, I will say that at different point in my career I was doing different things uh, in grad school I was a seven day a week um, you know, I, I think I took the half days on Sundays. That was my view of the world. Uh, that was usually go out with, for lunch with my friends and then go back to watch football afterwards. Um, as a uh, professor, when I first took the job, I worked uh, evenings, but I didn't work weekends. Uh, my wife and I both worked longer hours, so we were going right up basically until dinner, and then we'd get back on and do some work after dinner. And that was a pretty typical thing. Um, but now we're at the point where it's, it's much... I like to constrain it, as you said, having family as well as having um, uh, personal time, uh, you know, be it whatever we want to do, I need to find a time to schedule that into my life, and the only way I can do that is to say, I need a hard and stop on work, because you know, this is a job that doesn't end. I think that's, that's you know, sort of embedded in that question fr from Lutz, uh, Lutz um, this notion of, well, how do I fit it in here? Well, the, the issue is you could spend all of your time working on your teaching. Honestly, you could prep, you could practice it. I have, I have friends who actually go through their lectures and they practice their lecture twice before they go and give the lecture. Wow. So go through it twice. And that, that's a path. I mean, if that's yeah. the way you want to go, that's a path. Uh, I, I am not that, uh, but that, that's an option you can do. Um, you can, as you said, you know, Robert, you're saying you're working at, at spare moments from your daughter in the bathroom and you can do that. Uh, all of this is a space that there is no off because there's always more obligation. There's always another analysis you can run. There's always uh, more writing that can be done. There's more scheduling you can do. There's more responses. There's more outreach. There's more whatever. There's always an unlimited, unending space. So yeah. you have to put those internal boundaries. If you say, Chris, that you don't want to um, spend a lot of your time, you know, meeting with students in the lounge, you know, off time, that's, that's a boundary you have to put in yourself. Uh, I had a, a colleague back when I was at Michigan State who um, took out the guest chairs in his office and brought in a folding chair. And that when a student came to the office, he would break out the folding chair as to show his time of, you can be here, but this is temporary, like this chair. It was a very strong symbolic action, but it was also done because he needed to protect his time. And so, you know, look, I'm not going to spend every day, every hour with your, my door open. And I've got a colleague here that... Uh, her door is always open, and there are always people in her office, even when she's not in her office. There are students in her office. Um, that's a different world. Now, she's got, taken an entirely teaching-oriented and service-oriented model, but that means you can't do anything else. And I think at times you can hear her regret uh, not being able to do some of the things that she knows how to do. You know, she, right. she did research, and she can't do it because she spent all the rest of her time on this because yeah. it will allow to unlimited bleeding of in your time. Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. This job will take as much from you as you are willing to give it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, and I should clarify that I um, I spend time with my students. I hang out with my students. I am very aware, though, of the time that I'm spending like that because I know that I have other things to do. So I enjoy I really enjoy hanging out with my students. I really enjoy having them in my office. But I'm also very aware of sort of boundaries and and it's a balance that takes time to learn how to mm -hmm. do. Uh, but yeah, like I said, this job will take as much from you as you are willing to give it, and it will always be willing to take more. Yeah. I think a lot of the, it also depends on 
your particular institution and what you're rewarded for. Right. Um, it's best certainly focus where the reward is um, because you can get really dysfunctional behavior and have a blowback at you. If, if you're at a teaching school and you're a research wonk, mm-hmm. you got to make sure you do the teaching or, yeah, the other way around. Or once you start doing admin things, there's a reason academics bitch about admin because you've lost a lot of your control um, because everything's in groups and there's committees and it's all this weird consensus time management. Uh, and it's very frustrating where you go, oh, man, I had that time. It's the only time everybody can else can meet. And it's just like, oh, crap, the provost wants to meet at 7 a.m.? Yeah. What the hell, dude? Go to sleep. You know, and you're just kind of, you're stuck. Because if that's when it is, that's when it is. You know, yeah. well, you or the, they'll fire your ass. <laughs> I had a, a, a colleague who jokes that um, the ability to actually schedule a dissertation committee for dissertation defense should be enough to, def- to pass your defense. Hell yeah. Because getting five academics in the same place at the same time is already just, congratulations, you've won. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, if yeah, nothing else, don't, but don't be one of those ones that schedules meetings and doesn't show. Oh. oh. Hate that. This drives me crazy, and it tends to. It's a fairly common practice among academics, and I'm 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 from the school of you know, uh, early is on time, on time is late, late is unacceptable, mm-hmm. you know, and that's just like oh god, these people drive me crazy. It's like I carved that an hour for you, man. Yeah, never again. You are dead to me. Yeah, I, I don't tolerate that. I, I'm more than happy to let people know how upset I am with them, my students and other people who I'm supposed to meet with. I, I, because I'm big on time management, I do not like it when you disrespect my time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I will always respect your time. So just return the favor. Um, yeah, it's, you're right. I've noticed that. Now, I should say that even though I do set up pretty hard start and end time boundaries, there are times at this job where they have to be violated. Oh, yeah, always. You know, but you do what you got to do. Yeah, I mean, when the provost calls and says, hey, can you meet at 7 a.m.? Guess what you have to do? Yep. You meet at 7 yep. a.m. Crap rolls yep. downhill. <laughs> yep. yep. <laughs> right. That's right. Uh, so, poor PhD students. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I thought one other thing that we should talk about, and this was brought up by Stephen, I think this is a great idea um, during the pre-show, is talking a little bit about how the workload changes as a function of, of um, the cr- stage in which you're in your career. Mm-hmm. Because how you spend your time as an assistant professor can be quite a bit different as how you spend your time as a full professor. And uh, I would suspect that even as a full professor, as a sort of a late stage full professor, your time is spent differently than an early stage full professor. Uh, so, so and as well as layering in, you know, do you have a PhD program? Do you right. have administrative like departmental chair or you, you know, uh, running a center or whatever it might be? There's a lot of other aspects to it. Sure. Oh, sure. This is, uh, this is a pretty complicated question, actually, to answer because there's so many variables. Uh, I can, you know, speak for myself that in some ways uh, it, it sounds like a cop out. But in some ways I have more time as a full professor to pursue my research. And in other ways I have less time. So like right now. Uh, I'm on sabbatical. That doesn't count. So let's talk about last semester before I was on sabbatical. I wasn't assigned to any major committees. But because I'm a full professor, I could easily be selected for some real major committees that are complete time drain on, mm-hmm. when it comes to research. And so it really depends on the year and what the service load is like as to what, you know, you might think, oh, well, fool, you're not chasing tenure anymore. Well, that's true, but you're also one of the experienced faculty at the institution and, you know, you can, you're shielded uh, from things. So you can do certain service activities that other people don't want to do. Right. Uh, because but of the, you say that the other side of that is that when you're a junior faculty member, you're you're shielded from certain service activities. That's true. Right? You're not going to be able to be put on those committees or they don't want you on those committees. If you're being put on a bunch of committees as, you know, the core curriculum or um, undergraduate curriculum committee <laughs> as a first year faculty member, you quit. won't publish ever again. You should quit <laughs> right then. I mean, you don't have enough time in your life because that is a that is, in many respects, a full-time job. You have to learn the entire curriculum for every program at the university. Yeah. Well, let me tell you a little story. My first year, I was chosen as the assistant professor representative from the former College of Natural Sciences and Mathematics for an ad hoc 
P&T Policy Review Committee. Oh, God. Where we reviewed 17 departments' P&T policies. Yeah, that's for as a first year uh, faculty member, that was uh, that was interesting. You didn't stay there? Why? <laughs> it had nothing to do with why I left. Um, but yeah, it was. Oh wait, no, I take that back. My memory, uh, my memory's getting bad in my old age. I I was chosen my first year. The work started my second year. Yeah. Well, I'm so, on two committees right now. Yeah. Um, that I'm. I'm on the AACSB assessment, right, which is the top accreditation for my college. Okay. And I'm on the graduate committee, which means I'm in charge of all PhD, MBA programs, the master's of accounting programs, all these for setting curriculum and any changes, anytime anybody wants a waiver um, for all these. If I was junior, either one of those would have killed me or been a full-time job. Now they're just another thing you're expected to do because only full can serve on those. And it's just, you know, and they're appointed. And it's just like, yeah, you step up and you serve. But what I can do now in probably two hours in a week would have easily taken 40 because I, I, I wouldn't have known what was important, what to blow off, right. how to read, you know, a thousand pages worth of documents. You learn like, well, okay, just skim this and this is what's important. And I'll bring them with me to the meeting and look it up if it's relevant. Right. If you're if you're junior faculty in that, how would you know? You don't have that BS detector yet. Yeah, you have no idea right. what's relevant. Yeah. So well, I mean, yeah, that, that you've got to be shielded for, from committee work when you're new. Yeah, that, that takes a really broad uh, point there to be, to be made in terms of what is the expectations for you as a junior faculty member. What is what do they want? And this is where you need to, as a brand new faculty, sit down with your department chair and get a sense of what did they want you to do, what should you be doing, and what are the policies at that university. Because, you know, we're talking a, a somewhat similar policy process in terms of selecting committees and so forth, and every place is different here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at, at, at my institution, what we do is it's basically elected, it's nominated by and elected by the faculty writ large within the college for all, all activities. Um, that's different than my previous institution where it was assigned by the department chair. Uh, I've got a friend in a university, though, who there's a committee on committees, and the committee on committees selects the committees, yeah. the, other, the other committees within the institution. Yeah, we now, have those he here. Has, takes, he takes a long game. Um, so he, you, can so you can nominate yourself for certain committees, and you basically are encouraged to nominate yourself for like three committees. So he picks um, the Big 12 Athletic uh, Committee, he picks the um, uh, – there was another one along those lines, another athletic one. Maybe it was just sort of like the NCAA committee and then something else that was sort of fun. And the idea being the at the university level, these are the ones that everybody wants. And so you're choosing – I'm going to select these committees as the ones I really want, and it turns out I never get them, and that's a real shame. Hmm. Um, and so he has now been a faculty member for – nine years uh, and has never served on a committee. Oh, bastard. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but a good chair should protect junior faculty. Yeah. So but in my opinion, that's, that's the chair's the case, job. That's why you need to go eyes wide open. Yeah. You, need, you need to see what they're doing and what they're expecting. I, you know, I have a good friend of mine who talked about his first job, the first committee when he first uh, walked onto a job as a junior faculty member was to be on the undergraduate curriculum committee. And he got fired from it in the first semester because he refused to learn anything about the courses. Now, that's not necessarily the way you set the, the relationship with the provost or so forth, but it was a nobody protected him at all at a research institution, and so he said, I'm going to sabotage this in some respects. Now, I, I don't recommend that. That is not my advice. Clarify this. Don't sabotage your committees. Yeah. But you need to understand that not every place is going to protect you. Not every department chair is, is suave enough of this. Uh, maybe not every department chair has the political capital to be able to do that. Um, if you have senior faculty members who are, you know, not participating, then you run the risk that it's going to be pushed down to you because the senior guys won't do it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's up to you to protect your own time. Yeah. And it does take a while to learn how to do that, how to balance what assignments to give in your classes with what's going on service wise that semester. It's, and not to sound sort of like a, uh, it, you have to take a holistic view mm -hmm. 
Okay. And you have to realize, okay, I've got this really big service commitment this semester. Therefore, I may assign fewer papers or I may assign different problem sets to my classes, right? Mm -hmm. Or so, things have to give. I mean, if you try to go full on in every one of those three areas each semester, you're just going to burn out. Yeah. You're get help. Life. You got to get help from any senior faculty that can teach you some tricks. Yes. Like there, there are many legitimate ways to assess uh, your students. Some can be very time consuming yep. and it doesn't mean they're better than the ones that are faster. Right. Mm -hmm. So you just got to keep in mind of, oh, I've got this really cool assignment that I think is really great. And oh yeah, that's going to take me 60 hours to grade. Or I can give the multiple choice test on the Scantrons. You know, and depending on the course, if it's a survey course where you're vocabulary building, the Scantron may be a perfectly legitimate assessment technique, in which case, do the damn Scantrons. Right. Don't blow off 60, you know, hours grading something that is not really going to give you or your students anything better than the quicker way. Um, or if you have a light tricks. service load that semester, try the 60 hour assignment. But go in it with both eyes open saying, okay, this is going to be a real time-consuming exercise to grade. But you know what? I want to try it. I want yeah. to see how well it works. I would still run it by a senior faculty member because they might look at it and go, oh, dude, no, oh, don't yeah. do that. Yeah. I've done that before. It was not a good decision. Yeah. Yeah. Running it by a senior faculty member? or <laughs> <doing> <laughs> <it> <laughs> say, say that They may look at this and say, I've tried that exact thing because I was oh. like you 20 years ago and I tried it and it failed horribly. Sure. Um, I mean, that, that's a broader point, too. You, you should, when you step foot on a campus, you need to find yourself a, a mentor within that, that program. Uh, you need somebody who has been through the ropes and has an understanding of what's happening here and somebody you can trust and come to with this. I mean, that's, a, that's beyond just a time management recommendation. That's a, I want to learn the culture. I want to learn how do I navigate. I want to learn tenure expectations. I want to learn. I want to learn. You need somebody that you can do and, and spend that time with to get something out of. Yeah. Um, and I definitely, I, I can tell you exactly who that was at my first job. I can tell you who that is on my current job. And I'm a senior faculty member now. You know, there's not that many who, have, who are at higher levels than me in, in reality. I'm a full professor, and yet I still have mentorship here because there are people who have been doing it for 30 years, and I've only been doing it for 10. Right. You know, that, that's important to understand where you are and what other things you can do because yeah. there's still more things that come up. Should you take the editorship at a journal? Should you do this? Should you do that? Well, and just being in a new institution, when I got – I've, I've been on this this new gig. I've got six months. I'm an endowed, full for chaired professor. I immediately found a junior faculty member who had been here three years, because they're the ones that can tell me all the transition crap to this place. Right. Um, so sometimes, I mean, there's a faculty member in my department who's been here 50 years. He could not help me in the slightest on how to onboard to this university. <laughs> you know. Uh, other stuff, yeah, he knows all the institutional history. He knows how things actually get done, where to push. And it's just like, no, if you really want that done, yeah, that's what the policy manual says. But go to central administration and talk to this admin. Well, know, that's because he actually literally knows where the, bar the bodies are buried. In fact, he may have buried <laughs> bodies himself because he's outlived them. Yeah, well, right. he's been a professor here longer than I've been alive. <laughs> so. And some schools have formal um, – mentor mentee programs uh both of my institutions did even when i changed institutions and i had been you know i'd been in four years at that point it was useful for me to find a mentor because it was again what are those cultural differences mm -hmm. of that institution uh if you get stuck with a bad mentor it happens all right don't hesitate to find your own uh do what you have to with your official mentor okay fine uh but if, and I, I was fortunate. I was never stuck with a bad mentor. But if you do, and it, it does happen, if you do, you know, do what you have to do with the official one and then find somebody on the side, you know, and, and, and work with them. All right. Well, we have hit approximately the half hour mark. So I think we will go ahead and wrap this up. If there are topics that you wish we would have covered in this episode, please email us uh, at... Um, you could email us at a professor's life at gmail.com. We will get that email. You can tweet us at a prof's life. That's P R O F S life. Uh, and suggest show ideas like Lutz did or places you would like us to expand upon. Uh, let's see. Until then, everybody, just keep writing. <laughs>